genesis of this session on personal financing you know lies in a conversation with an alumna who told us that when she passed out and when began to earn she had no idea how to budget and where to invest i'm you're sure this is the plight of our current students as well many of us may be older but we are equally clueless when it comes to you know how to invest whether you know all these words like debentures and equity and mutual funds it's it's a it's a maze for us so to unravel this is why we thought let us have this session and we are lucky to have with us today ms asha martin whom we have had the privilege of listening to before also as you know at young leaders conference on campus and also at global summits let me just introduce her with a few words a career banker asha's 31 years of experience covers the entire banking spectrum from government to private to multinational institutions she actually graduated in english literature from kerala university with first rank before doing her mba in finance she began her career with reserve bank of india before the winds of liberalization guided asha to india's first major private sector bank icici bank where she grew to supervising 42 branches with a sales team of 2000 employees when doish bank started its private and business client sector she was selected as senior vice president and went on to lead the southern and eastern region of the bank after a seven year stint with doish bank she joined barclays wealth as director for the private client and investment banking group in 2009 she won the mma's outstanding manager of the year award she is currently a director in iifl wealth management limited india's largest wealth management firm and to moderate this session we have none other than our dynamic vibrant beloved dr ani jacob our director who is also happens to be a good friend of Asha Martin and i think in the, you know she almost didn't make it and she actually had to rush over here because a whole time she was you know tied up with a board of studies meeting at hindustan university but she did manage and we are so glad that both of them are going to be here for this great session we look forward to it madam director request you to take over thank you anita i don't think i would ever wanted to miss this moderation with the asha for sure Ms. Asha Martin, our financial expert for today, Dr. Devasundari, Principal KCG College of Technology, faculty, mothers of our dear students who have uh, who are available online with us today, and my dear students, a good evening to all. When Dr. Anita and I were discussing on how to bring about awareness about managing personal finances or to inculcate the habit of financial stability for our ladies on campus, I could not think of a wiser name. I would vouch for this expert advice due to personal experiences too. Some brilliant thoughts and information had been shared when we had a conversation regarding investments. Thank you Asha for taking time off on a Saturday to be with all of us and share your expertise on financial planning. The term financial planning is in some ways different for women than that of men due to some particular circumstances in their life. Now women tend to take more breaks from their career than men due to various reasons. This makes it very important for women to plan their finances more carefully. When it comes to financial stability, I personally feel for every every woman it can be the strongest need even if you consider Maslow's hierarchy needs on par with food, water and shelter. Now the year 2020 was a watershed year the world over when individuals as well as professionals felt the adverse impact of volatility uncertainty complexity and ambiguity a profound shock to our societies and economies the covid-19 pandemic underscores society's reliance on women both on the front line and at home in times of crisis when resources are strained and institutional capacity is limited women and girl face disproportionate impacts with far reaching consequences that are only further amplified in context of fragility conflict and emergencies so that brings us to these thoughts on why is it important that we need to inculcate a savings habit right from the earlier years true that our parents are our providers till we get into a profession but probably the habit can be developed in the formative years also it's important to understand how and why financial goals are required for every individual in fact women need to understand even better because at all phases of life 
On some pretext or the other, we tend to work with budgets, support family needs, we reduce expenses of the family, save for the family and whatnot. So taking that thought a bit further, Asha, my first question would be, how important is it for women to understand financial planning? I would, we would like to hear from you on that. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Annie and the KCG College for giving me this opportunity. Am I audible now? Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, yeah. Asha, you are. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, coming back to your question, um, Dr. Annie, uh, see, I would uh, initially like to make a fine line of divide between saving and investing. Uh, saving is a term that you used quite a bit when you uh, went through your introduction. And saving is something that all of us can do from even a very young age. I remember when I was working with ICICI Bank uh, in Bangalore many years back, uh, we used to do a program with some of the schools in our neighborhood where we introduced piggy banks. So these piggy banks were actually given to school children so that they could start saving from their pocket money. Now, so if, if a child got 100 rupees, we were telling them, encouraging them to keep aside 10 rupees or five rupees or some amount in this piggy bank so that maybe when it's the parent's birthday or their own birthday or they wanted to do something special, they had a little kitty in the piggy bank. Same way, that's why the bank account into which our salaries and all are getting credited is called a savings bank. So, but the difference between a savings bank and actually investing is actually a, is, there is a big difference. Savings is something we can do from even as young as a child when we start getting our first pocket money. Whereas investing is a fairly more advanced and uh, I, I would say something that needs to be given of a larger thought to. So coming back to your question of how important financial planning is, I think financial planning is very important for anyone who has decided to start investing. Now, why I say that is uh, when you start invest, so when you save, you're actually not expecting a great return. You're just keeping aside money to use it for an occasion or for some, some need that will arise later. But when you start investing, with every investment, there is a financial plan that is linked to it. So as an individual, I make a financial plan. Now, what entails a financial plan? I first need to understand my current financial situation. So if I'm getting 100 rupees, what is it that I can keep aside? You know, for some of us, uh, I can maybe can keep aside straight away 50% of it. So first I need to determine for somebody else, it may be 60, for someone else, it may just only be 10%, but I'm sure for all of us, there's something we can keep aside. So the first thing is to determine our current financial situation. What is it that I can keep aside? The second is to develop financial goals. So I'm sure the people who are listening to me are at different stages of their social, uh, life cycle, if I may call it. So some of us have just started earning. So for us, uh, the sky is the limit. I can save a lot. Some of us are mothers who are concerned about their children's higher education, about their daughter's marriage, things like that. Some of us may be reaching retirement. So we are more concerned about, uh, you know, coming to the end of our job, of our career. So I need to plan for my retirement. Reti though I always believe retirement is something you need to plan for much earlier and not when you reach the twilight years of your career. So so you, the financial goals that you develop will depend on which part of the social life cycle you are. And then you create and implement a financial action plan. So if a mother says that I have, I need so much for my daughter's higher education, she needs to plan backwards. What is it that I need to put every month, every year to need that to meet that corpus. So who has a small child and looking at educating her in a good engineering or a medical college, please remember education grows at about 10, the cost of education grows at about roughly 10% every year. So what I plan today is not what I plan today, but what is the 10% at the end of eight or 10 years that I need to invest in now? Then mothers could also think about their daughter's wedding. So that is another financial goal. Then there could be medical requirements that I need to. So if I have a hereditary problem of diabetes in the family or, or uh, there's cancer or there is uh, heart problems, et cetera, then I know that you know maybe me or my family members could also be susceptible to those. So health is something I need to plan for, kitty for that. So 
then you so after you've created and uh, this uh, develop these financial goals you create and implement the financial action plan it's very very important to re evaluate and revisit these plans because once i've made an investment it's it's not shut it and forget it you know like uh, hero honda has this ad fill it shut it forget it for petrol when they when they make the bikes the bikes are so good that you don't need to do anything but a financial plan is not like that it needs to be revisited uh, at least minimum once a year if not more often maybe a quarter one uh, once in six months once in a year because you need to tweak the plans a little your goal may not have changed but where you have put your money may need to undergo a little bit of a tweak so this is how i would broadly look at financial planning and and i would say the parameters are the same for each and every one of us whichever phase of our life cycle we are in okay so asha in fact you have triggered some you know profound thoughts on actually why we need to do a uh, financial planning so we've set our minds thinking and uh, actually women tend to invest more in safe bets like since you've mentioned about financial planning i'm just looking at it from the uh, the psychological or the personality traits now women uh, they actually tend to uh, put more in say um, invest more in safe bets as they are risk averse at least that's what literature says and when it comes to their finances and because of the uncertainty they look for safety of their capital while women tend to save more money they are less likely to make investments this could be because they are less exposed towards the financial products and their lack of awareness towards the multiple choices for investment and this actually puts us at a disadvantage hence i think it's important that women should invest in equity based on their risk appetite due to their risk appetite to make their wealth grow in fact you were mentioning about this you know you you save my, uh, you do some investment in 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 for it to grow actually but do you think that is so i mean it should it be like that how does how do we actually do some intelligent investment like what are the products that will give us the best returns we would like to have a bit of understanding about that okay so you know, normally when when you do any kind of investment there are two broad things other than this financial goals etc which i talked about the two things are one is what is your liquidity requirement so if it's if it's a, a plan for a immediate so if the child is in the 10th and you are planning to send her or, or in the 11th or 12th and you are planning to send her to college in a year or so then obviously you need to take that money out quickly so the liquidity requirement is very short term or if you are planning to invest in in a new uh, consumer durable one year down the line and i've got a bonus and i want to uh, invest it into a new fridge or a new tv or whatever uh, one year down the line my liquidity uh, bucket is is very very liquid whereas if i have something so so that's so the first criteria is how what is your liquidity requirement if it's a very very liquid requirement then there is a certain uh, uh, pot that you need to put which i'll come to the second is how much risk i'm willing to take which you have touched upon so so if my liquidity is like very immediate then i cannot put it into something like equity so broadly the asset classes that we currently are looking so coming back to your question on what is intelligent investing where we can invest let me come back to uh, the different asset classes that are available the first is what everybody knows equity where you get into stocks now how you can get into stocks is a different aspect but we'll just cover the asset classes so the first is equity definitely there's risk but if you're willing if your risk uh, if your liquidity requirement is a long term like you need the money only after a 10 year period or even a 5 year period then there's absolutely no problem getting into equity though it may be risky it's only risky in the short term because you're seeing it go up and down over a one year period or a two year period but if i'm willing to keep it for a 5 year 10 year 15 year period then equity is if you ask me the the best asset class to be to be in i i personally uh, have believed in equity all my life and i i will continue even at the age of 80 <laughs> i will continue to invest in equity so there's also a rule which says how much in equity the thumb rule is 100 minus your age so if you are a 30 year old you can go up to 70% in equity but these are just i have clients in calcutta when i was in dochi i used to manage east in calcutta 80 85 90 year old gentlemen who are 100% in equity going by this thumb rule they should only be about 10 or 15% in equity but they are 100% because they say the kind of returns i get in equity i will not get anywhere else so that's the first asset class the second is the fixed income or the debt part which is safe portion so 
that will include your fixed deposit, bonds, uh, mutual funds, uh, all the uh, debt mutual funds, those kind of things. The third asset class is real estate. Now, real estate, again, I'm not coming to the type of how you can invest in real estate, but real estate as an asset class. The fourth asset class, which I feel is interesting and needs to be there at least about 20% of your portfolio is the alternates. And now what are these alternates? The alternates, uh, one is gold. The second, so gold again, it can be physical, it can be through ETFs, it can be bonds, it can be whatever. The second is international equities, which again is a, is, is something I think all of us need to have. And today it's very easy to invest in international stocks. Indian funds themselves do it. They invest in the international market. And the other international, I'm sorry, alternative asset class is currency. So you can invest in currency, whether it's the dollar, the GBP. Actually, by investing in international funds, you're also taking an exposure to international currency because when you invest in US, you have an exposure to the, uh, to the US dollar. So these are the broad asset classes. Now, if you ask me, the safest amongst this is debt. But debt today, if you get a five, five and a half percent, you are lucky. And then with all the taxation that goes with it, if you get about two, two and a half percent, great. So that's the kind of return you would get in fixed income. Now, do you want your investments to just give you a two and a half, three percent, which anyway, if you just put in your savings account, you would get, or would you want to get something a 10% or 15%, maybe even more when equity markets do well in something like equity. So while equity has risk, that part of your portfolio, so if you have 100 rupees and you say, I can keep 30 rupees for long term, for 10, 15 years, please put that 30 rupees in equity because the returns which equity can give you, no asset class in the world can give you. I mean, that, and that's a proven fact. Uh, I unfortunately didn't prepare slides for this presentation, but I, uh, I mean, we, I, we have data which shows how equity over a 10, 15, 20 year period has, has given you returns which no other asset class in the world can give you. And that's steady returns year after year after year. So coming back to uh, Dr. Annie's question on the risk, there definitely is a risk, no doubt. Because when the pandemic happened in February, stock markets just crashed and all my client portfolios were negative. Today, when you look at the same portfolios, they've already moved up comfortably 14, 15, 20%, some even more. So, so, so that's what equity gives you. It gives you a trough and it also gives you a high. You must be willing to, you, you basically need strong, strong hearts. And I think women have that in plenty. I mean, we have seen so much in our lives at home, at our workplaces, with our children, <laughs> with our husbands, you know. So we have strong hearts. So equity is, is nothing, you know. The, the, the kind of uh, volatility that equity gives is nothing compared to all the things that we have seen in our life. So I strongly advocate that, you know, you must be there in equity. How to get into equity, maybe if uh, Dr. Annie wants me to cover at some point okay. later, I can do that. So in fact, you have uh, you know, brilliantly explained the whole thing about what is a safe investment and what to get into. So this, these uh, co constant thoughts come to our mind. Is it pension or insurance scheme? Is it safe to get into equity or debt funds or should one go with uh, stock investments? In fact, that's what you have touched upon. So many terminologies like you have SIP, you have uh, ESDA, you have a systematic uh, investment plan, you have something called a withdrawal plan, you have mutual funds. Again, there are category, categories which say you have mid-term, I mean, mid, uh, mid to small, mid-cap, mid yeah. all those cap funds. It gets a tad too confusing for a normal person. Yes. So when you mention all this, what, what do you think or how do one, uh, like a common man, research for credible information? and to know about the performances of these instruments, these financial instruments or products, which are the, uh, which are the resources that one should look for? Like we, you mentioned equity there, I'm sure there'll be like so many uh, choices for that. If you go into debt funds, you know, so which is the source that one could, uh, a common person who does not have much of financial terminology knowledge or, you know, the, all these words, who would you approach? Or what are the sites that we look for? Because there is an overload of information everywhere. So mm -hmm. what are the credible, um, either a human intervention is better or we have uh, very credible websites or, you know, there are magazines I know and there are, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, apps which could speak. There are a lot of uh, financial magazines which could talk about it. In your opinion, if, if we need to understand the financial market and the performance of certain funds, because just like you said, when it hit low during this, everything crashed. 
but a lot of people took advantage who knew how to invest in what to invest, anticipating the growth of these products. And I'm sure they would have studied the previous performances of these instruments and invested wisely. So if we need to know about this, which are the sources of information or what are the credible sites that we go into? Right. One uh, site that's, uh, that's very commonly used and I think gives information in a very fair manner is money control. It's a very popular site. A lot of people access it. Uh, I've seen that they are very fair in, their, uh, uh, in the views that they give. Uh, don't give too much of biased information regarding funds, stocks, etc. And uh, so money control is definitely uh, a great site to access, whether it's stocks that you want to know how stocks have performed, whether it's mutual funds, everything is covered there. Uh, getting a good financial advisor makes a lot of sense, actually, because see, uh, you may or may not have the time to, you know, access these sites, etc. But if you have someone who's able to do that for you and take care of the portfolio, that makes a big difference, no doubt. Now, coming back to uh, some of these terms that you used, uh, you know, I, for one, am, am not a fan of insurance. So if I always feel that one of the most grossly missold products is insurance. Now, insurance, how I see it and how it should be seen, I believe, is what am I insuring? I'm insuring my life. So if I'm taking an insurance for my life, that is, so if I'm a, uh, the, a provider to my family and I bring X amount every month uh, as the kitty to run the household, and that X amount works out to Y amount per year, I need to take a policy that covers that Y amount in case of an eventuality and I'm not there. So what am I protect insuring? I'm insuring my life. But most of the insurances that are sold today are investment-linked insurances, which are terrible. And I thought it's important I bring this out today because the, the reason insurance is sold all over the world, I mean, more so in India than anywhere else, is the very, very high commissions that insurance have. Insurances used to have commissions of as high as 60% for the person who sell, sold it. IRDA brought it down to about 40% now, but 40% is still high when compared to a 1% or a 1.5%, which is what a mutual fund charges. So now, and, and the reason why I'm saying don't go for an investment linked insurance is the investments in an insurance plan are always just put there for 10, 15 years because the person who does that policy knows only if there is an eventuality or after a 15 year or a 20 year, will, will this insurance ever be taken out? So when it's taken out, then only someone will even look at the performance. So till then, let me do whatever investment. I'll just fill it, shut it, forget it, leave it there. Whereas in a mutual fund, which it's an actively managed fund. The fund manager is responsible for his uh, investment performance. So he works really hard to give you that return. Whereas in insurance, which is linked to investments, the, in, the, the returns are so, so terrible. And many of them show you that after a 15 year period or a 20 year period, you will get this kind of a figure. You wait for the 15 year, 20 year, you will actually get none of what they have said because there's inflation that has brought the things down, the, the value down. There, is, there, are, there are so many factors, the, the mismanagement or the badly managed investment that has brought the returns down. So insurance, if anyone wants to take, please take it only for insuring your life. And normally nobody sells that because the commission on that is zilch. There is zero commission on that. So nobody, I mean, the person who is selling it or distributing it doesn't find it, but that's what is important for us. Tomorrow as, as someone who is earning for the family, if I am not there and my family needs to get something because I'm not there, that lump sum will come to that. So whatever you insure yourself for, one crore, two crore. And a person who is who is actually very wealthy, so a lot of my HNI clients, they don't even need insurance because if their assets, their net worth is 100 crore, 200 crore, what do you insure them for? Sure. Nothing. So because you, I, I thought insurance, it's, it's very, very important that I touch upon. Now, pension again, a lot of pension funds are, are very long term. So they're not managed the way they should. I have seen a lot of clients put money in pension funds uh, where the return is about 7%, 8%. Whereas that same money, if they manage it, they bucket it. 
you know, as per their financial goals. So they put some portion in debt, they put some portion in long-term equity at the, by the time they retire and they want a pension or they want some income coming out of this, they actually get a, a bulk sum, which is maybe five or six times more than what this pension fund can give them. Unless it's a pension from the organization. So a lot of public sector companies have pension, which the that's a different thing. That kind of a pension fund is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a pension fund through the investment route, either through insurance or through a mutual fund, frankly, not a great idea at all. If you are able to bucket your investments, plan it well, invest it well in the right vehicles, you will get a far better kitty by the time you retire than what these could, could actually offer you. Then the other terms, like you said, yeah, large cap, mid cap, all those money control will give you. Um, uh, online, see today, there is a whole lot of, uh, uh, I know, you know, inputs that you can get online. And I, I think for a newcomer, for someone who's new in this field, use money control. I haven't really used any other uh, sites myself, uh, but uh, I think that's something that you could, you could use. So I'm just going to put it this way. So the buzzwords for financial planning or, you know, those who want to, who want to put down their financial goals would be equity. There is risk, in, uh, risk involved, but for the longer this thing, it's safe uh, and debt. Then we have real estate. We have gold ETF and bonds. We have uh, international equity stock. Yeah. Get your information from money control. Find yourself a recommended or a referred good financial advisor. Yeah. No to insurance and uh, pension schemes. Yeah, insurance only for term. term only is, for term. Yeah, term it's very, very good, no doubt. Uh, excellent, actually, for term. Very low premiums also, so you don't feel the pinch. Take a good policy, one crore, two crore, doesn't matter. The younger you are, the premium will be very, very minuscule. So I think uh, I've summed it all in, in terms of, you know, if you want to yes. put down your financial goals and do some uh, intelligent financial planning, this is. So now I'm going to move from this into something which is, uh, you know, not many people would have heard about. I mean, since you mentioned international uh, equities and stocks, um, you know, what about cryptocurrency? I mean, the whole terminology, there's a lot of buzz going around it, especially uh, maybe two, three weeks back, we heard how Musk, Elon Musk has gone and, you know, bought a lot of, uh, you know, uh, cryptocurrency and invested a lot into Bitcoins. And then we have a whole range of coins. In fact, all this digital, which is, we don't know the tangibility, the availability, I mean, the information regarding this. And due to some phenomenal growth in returns, you know, it fascinates a lot of people. And mm -hmm. I, I know that's the kind of risk that is attached to it. But how safe or how legal are these digital coins? Because when the new uh, budget was also going to be released, there were mentions, you know, that cryptocurrency, there's going to be new policies that are going to come, but still there was nothing touched upon. So the whole concept of cryptocurrency, digital coins, um, what is, in your opinion, how safe and legal are these? Okay. <clears throat> so if I were to compare it with uh, the other aggressive asset class, which is equity, uh, the good thing about cryptocurrency is uh, it does not um, get affected by equity markets or what happens in the markets. It's, it's an independent asset class. The other beautiful thing about a cryptocurrency is it's very limited in quantum. So you don't have a whole lot of it available. And so that's why it's also priced very high because it's a demand and supply uh, situation as far as bitcoins especially are concerned they are only just there's only a very limited supply that's available and then you uh, so now people don't buy one bitcoin because a single bitcoin is about $53,000 has come down to about 48,000 after tesla bought quite a bit but yes. so people buy just small portions you know you can buy a one, one by bitcoin. 100 uh, yeah, yeah one one part of a bitcoin you know so things like that now coming back to uh, regulation see in india it's not accept it's not regulated at i mean the rbi has very clearly said it's not an acceptable mode of uh, uh, trade or uh, etc so in india but it, it is just not uh, regulated it's not acceptable as a uh, 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 what do you call as a currency in any form as a uh, not at all but in the west especially in the us etc it uh, but having said that there are a lot of indians who do own cryptocurrencies in their portfolios now how do they do it there are certain they i think about three brokers all bombay based who have the platform to buy this for you so they can buy they they have a special kind of like a demat that you have for shares where you dematerialize your shares these there is a particular kind of account where the bitcoin or part of the bitcoin is held now the issue with all this is if i can't use it then it's 
so it, it has to be something that I can freely buy and sell. It should be tangible. I mean, we can do yeah, some transaction with it. Transaction yes. with. So one is, it is, first of all, it's not regulated here. RBI doesn't recognize it as a valid currency. And soon they are going to actually come out with very stringent rules against cryptocurrency. It's not going to be encouraged. RBI will soon come out. Maybe in less than a month, you will, you will hear some uh, uh, circulars and rulings being issued uh, on cryptocurrency. The government has asked for it and RBI will come out with it. So having said that, it definitely is not something that I would look at in our financial planning kitty at all. Mm -hmm. Because it's not something, so when I, when I do my financial planning, it's something that I would like to liquidate and use for the financial goals that I have. I can't plan cryptocurrency as part of that. But if I have a whole lot of wealth and I want some portion in cryptocurrency, that's a different issue. But when it's strictly, when I look at financial goals and financial planning, uh, I wouldn't uh, factor cryptocurrency as part of that. But once it's regulated and I can freely buy and sell, which I don't think will happen for cryptocurrency because it's so limited in supply and anything that's so limited, you will, you will have always a liquidity and a, a cash flow kind of problem. So when that's the case, I don't think at least for the next decade, maybe it may find, but people do, it's more like a fad, if I may call it, uh, keeping it in their portfolios. Mm -hmm, so there exactly. are a lot of people who do have it in their portfolios, good for them. But one thing I, I read about, it, uh, you also might have read in the papers, that this particular accounts where they house it have got passwords, which if you lose it, there is no way you can open that account. True. Very true. So if you have lost that password, then God bless your cryptocurrency and whatever you have in that, because it's just impossible to unlock and take it out. Then Correct. whatever you, and it's so expensive. It's not like, you know, it's it's not a cheap investment. Yes, so, but sometimes, you know, when, because of the way, you know, the younger generation. So I posed yeah. this question for the younger generation, you know, like yeah, if you get yeah. fascinated by the growth, I mean, yeah. that's what, right? How do you earn fast money? And so yeah. from, the, uh, the, from the, uh, the other age group to the younger age group, I mean, there are certain various or varied thoughts in which they do investment, right? So that's why Correct. I thought I would touch upon this. Yeah. And Asha, since today our audience are, uh, you know, engineering students and faculty, or basically for my students, I would want to pose this question. We right. are a technical institution. There's a lot of technological, uh, you know, um, inputs that are given. What is what about when we when we talk about cryptocurrency? You know, there's a lot. There's a one more word that is very blockchain. Closely Yes, closely at, uh, attached to it, which is blockchain technology. So mm -hmm. could you give, throw some light on that? And taking, uh, taking one step uh, ahead, and I also want to know about the latest buzzword, which is fintech. I mean, I can mm -hmm. see a lot of, you know, talk about uh, fintech being one of those opted courses, uh, you know, so you mm -hmm. have technology. If you want to, uh, you know, uh, go from this into a finan um, to understand uh, a better financial planning, you, you take up fintech. So could you throw some light on blockchain technology as well as what is fintech. Okay, these are very technological questions. So frankly, not too much in my area of expertise. But uh, having said that, so blockchain is something that the, the bitcoins, etc. use. So that's the reason there are not too many of them. Because they, the, the kind of engineering that goes into it uh, doesn't allow you to create too many uh, sets of the same uh, asset. So that's uh, what I understand from blockchain. Of course, there's a te uh, technical part to it, which uh, I did go, uh, listen to quite a lot of talks on cryptocurrency and blockchain, etc. but by some very renowned people. But frankly, maybe because I'm not from an engineering background, that really didn't stick into my head. The only thing I remembered was, uh, was this part that you can't uh, replicate multiply too it. much, oh, multiply okay. it. That's kind of, that is this blockchain uh, technology or structure that we talk about. And Bitcoin, see, today, if I look at just, if I look at it at $50, okay, it's today at 53, $50 itself tantamounts to close to about 36 lakhs for one Bitcoin, which is a hell lot of a money for a student or, you know, to think of even about, of course, you can buy a part of it, you can maybe buy for a three lakh or a four lakh, but it's a huge investment. So unless we really know, and we know that it's going to be, uh, that it's uh, rash, I mean, it, it's, it's approved by the Reserve Bank and the banking system, my suggestion is, you know, even if you have ways of getting into it, try not to. Actually, uh, more than more than trying to invest in it, I thought, you know, these terminologies, they should, every, they should be yeah, aware that, of it, you know, they absolutely. should know. 
Yeah, what that that is, is important. That's important because so they know uh, you know stay away from uh, you correct. know um, you know correct. all this bit uh, cryptocurrencies. Don't get carried yes. away when there's a lot of Absolutely. conversations happening. Yeah, so I actually that is why I thought you yes. know, it would no, be no, good that, to good to uh, for our uh, no, students no, also to understand. Yeah, that absolutely. Too. Yeah. Now, coming back to fintech, so fintech is the buzzword today, uh, whether, whether it's uh, for stock trading, so you have uh, uh, portals like Zeroda, uh, Five Paise, all of these are, you know, uh, highly technology, uh, finance and technology, that's the fintech part of it. Yes. So yes. there's even, even a thought that robo-advisory will be uh, what the future is going to be. So people like me will be redundant. And it will be robots who will be advising clients. So that's the robo advisory. Again, another uh, arm of uh, fintech P possible. Uh, but the only thing that would be missing is see, there is a every investing, there is a little bit of emotion attached to it too. And that will get over if you, if you go purely the fintech way. You know, the human aspect brings in a little bit of logical analysis. Logic can also be done by uh, robots and, and machines, I'm sure. But, but the, the emotional and the human angle, uh, which sets thinking and, and tries to rationalize between uh, why this and not this and, and stuff like that, uh, I think is still important in this. Because even in the field of medicine, for example, robo uh, surgeries are, are huge. Yeah. Surgeries are huge. The uh, Apollo Hospital, for example, in Chennai does a whole lot of surgeries through robots. I mean, they, they do the whole thing that while the doctor is sitting and maybe observing the whole thing, it's all done by robots. But but you still need that human behind to kind of to be there. So while uh, fintech is good, and I think uh, there's a, going to be a whole lot of uh, improvement in this area, we in fact have launched a, a fund that invests in companies that are into fintech. So what we so we call that the late tech fund, late stage tech fund. So these are funds not strictly uh, into robo stuff and all that, but fund uh, uh, companies like a Swiggy or a Zomato or a Delivery or a uh, or a uh, Zomato or Dunzo, for example, all depending on technology for their working, uh, invested by private equity firms, and where we see them going public, maybe in a year or two from now. So we have started this fund where clients can invest. So you can't directly buy a stake in Swiggy, though it's a great fintech, it's actually a great firm, actually a great technology platform uh, running very well. So whether it's a Swiggy or whether it's a Dunzo, you can't invest as an individual. But through this fund, through the private equity investors, you can find an investment so that when it goes public, you unlock your value. So, so there are some fintech funds, uh, fintech firms also, which we have included in this, uh, in this whole investment pot. So fintech definitely, I think, is the way forward. Um, um, I see a lot of um, a lot of activity finance related, which doesn't need too much of a human intervention or the logical mind coming in, moving into that. Like stock purchase, for example, you can do everything on zero da. Uh, I mean, it also throws up ideas on where to invest, what stock is the catch of the day, uh, stuff like that. That's another platform like money control, but uh, not so much of analysis, but more for investing that people do. It's a startup fund by, uh, I think, two very, very brilliant youngsters like your students who are on the call and, and, and doing great. So I think, yeah, fintech is, is what uh, is the way forward. I yeah, in fact, you've put it down beautifully, you know, something which is intangible, high perceived risk, uh, you know, we don't know how it's going to perform, you know, we don't know the returns on it, a human emo emotional intervention is definitely uh, required. Thank you for those, uh, some admirable insights, Asha, and I would, I would just put it this way before I, you know, hand over this whole thing to our students and open it out to questions. Um, though there is uh, no difference, in, because I'm sure they'll be waiting for, uh, you know, to ask you a lot of, um, you know, questions regarding their personal uh, finances or how to manage it. There is no, even though there is no difference in a way a woman or man can invest, I would say the best way to make up for the lost time and money is to invest smarter. So get a lot of credible information from the right sources and make informed choices in order to maximize your financial gains. Do not save what is left after spending but spend what is left after saving. I would put it that way. Thank you, Asha, on behalf of KCG College of Technology and on my personal behalf. But let me open the whole thing to the students. I mean, in fact, uh, any of our students or faculty or uh, would like to ask uh, Asha any questions, it's open now. 
Uh, you can just uh, type it into the chat box or. Uh, uh, so pass. I'm going to take, I'm going to in fact take this, uh, pass on this question to you. We have a question from our faculty, Dr. Amrita. Ask uh, small, small caps. Yeah, uh, small for a long term. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, Dr. Amrita, I would say um, excellent investment because small caps, so small caps are basically those companies which have a turnover. So the, the large, mid and small are, uh, you know, based on the turnover uh, of the company. So that, and that keeps changing depending on the sizes of the company, but broadly anything less than about 500 crores or even I think small, there are, there are nano caps also. So anything less than a hundred crore will come under the nano cap category. Anything in, within the 250, 500 would form under the small cap. Now, small caps, uh, the, the interesting thing about small caps is uh, when markets correct, they get, they correct very steeply. So if you have a portfolio, which is overweight small caps, your portfolio would look terrible when the market's correct. But if you, do a careful investing. So if you have 100 rupees to put into equity, put 70 rupees into large caps. Now, large caps are the big companies. I'll just give you the names, a Reliance or a Tata or a Godrej, uh, ICICI Bank, HDFC Bank, most of the banking companies, etc. All these are the large caps. Now, why I say 70% is when the markets go up, they do fairly well. They give you a 12 to 15% return. When the markets correct, they will correct, but they will not fall as steeply, steeply as a small cap. And the mid and the small you have as 30% of your portfolio, out of which keep 20% in mid cap and keep 10% in small cap. Now, the beauty of small caps is when they do well, they can give you phenomenal returns. So if you take a small example of a small cap, Prikol, a small company in Coimbatore, uh, which provides automotive uh, which supports the automotive industry. They, they provide things to the automobile sector. It's a small cap. Uh, VGuard, which is a stabilizer company in Kerala, that's an example of a small cap. Uh, uh, Reflex, uh, Reflexo shoe, uh, chapels, I think that's uh, slippers. Again, that's a Kerala-based company. That's an example of a small cap. So these are, and then there are nano caps, which most of us wouldn't even have heard of, which are very small companies, but have given 23, 24% kind of, maybe even more, 30% plus returns when the going is good. But when the correction happens, uh, so coming back to your question, we need to have small caps in our portfolio, but ideally keep it to about 10% of your equity portion. Do we have uh, any more? Thank you, Asha. Thank you for answering it so well. Um, do, you, do we have any more questions from anyone? I think you've explained it all so beautifully well. <laughs> you have not given any scope for any more, you know, ambiguity or uh, this thing. So, oh, all right. So then thank you, Asha, on behalf of KCG College of Technology and on my personal behalf for enlightening all of us, even personally, I think I would have gained a lot of uh, information from today's session. You have a happy and uh, blessed weekend. And of course, a beautiful Women's Day to all present here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thanks, Ashi. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you.